Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. My younger brother, Wyatt, has always been a darn firecracker. Doctor said when he came out of my mother's womb, he didn't cry, and that was confirmed by my parents. He just came out, they slapped him, and he looked mad about it. Over the years, people would say stuff like, that kid has been here before, and I just concluded that he has a warrior spirit because the dude legit is not a afraid of nothing and no one. Well, when I was 16 and he was 12, that warrior spirit got us into a situation that I would have never imagined. It was the 4th of July, and Wyatt wanted to go shoot fireworks. Never mind that the sun was still up, he wanted to do it, and so we rode our bikes down the road to the firecracker stand. Wyatt, it's still daylight out. We shouldn't be shooting fireworks yet. Come on, let's just go get them. Now, by down the road, I mean five miles and back. When we get there, we only have 60 bucks and he buys every Roman candle he can get. Wyatt loved holding them in his hands and shooting them at people. So I knew, without a doubt, at the first opportunity, he was going to shoot one at me. It was how he was, crazy. So, as we are riding back, he starts shooting them in the air, Wyatt being Wyatt. On the way home, there is this underdeveloped stretch of road on both sides, and he's just riding along, shooting the Roman candles in the woods, laughing and talking about how he was going to shoot them at Dad. I'm telling him not to, because Dad would spank him. We leave the area and come to this little stretch of house where these boys are playing outside and he starts shooting Roman candles at them. These guys had to be 15 years old and the next thing you know, they are chasing us and Wyatt is seriously enjoying the fact they want to beat him up. As he rides along shooting Roman candles at them as they try to catch us. When I tell you that my little brother is missing screws, He's crazy. One of them gets hit, swivels off and falls, and the others stop to check on him. And we keep going to get to the house, and I'm like, listen, you need to stop messing with people. He's not listening, so go to tell mom. But she's on the phone, and dad hasn't made it home yet. Now, I'm aggravated, sitting in my room, and in the background, I can hear him outside shooting the Roman candles, but I figured, you know, he's shooting at squirrels and birds. Thirty minutes pass, and I hear him tearing into the house, running up the stairs. I hit that man in the woods with the Roman candle. Come see. Wyatt, what man are you talking about? There ain't no man in the woods. Yes, there is. I hit him in the belly. Come see. Reluctantly, I get up and go outside, thinking he's imagining things and that if I go outside and walk around, then he will leave me alone. So, now we're outside, and he's walking me into the woods behind our house. He was about ten feet ahead of me. We need to talk about this, Wyatt, I said. We don't have to talk about anything. Just follow me. We walked no more than fifty yards into the trees, and he said, this is where he was, and I shot him. What are you talking about? There's nothing here, I say. Just keep following me, he says. I'm looking around at the area and don't see anything. So I say, okay, bud, well, come on, let's go inside. And he's like, no, let's find him and runs off. We need to go back, Wyatt. This isn't safe, I say, starting to feel uneasy. As we continue to walk, I realize there is something moving to our right, about 45 yards away. Wyatt, stop! Stop! I scream. 
he stops, turns in my direction, and is like, what? We need to go home. Let's go. I say, trying to remain calm. As the words go are coming out of my mouth, I hear this growling sound, this breathy growl, nothing like I've ever heard in the woods before. What the heck is that? I whisper to myself. Wyatt lights another Roman candle, and as he is lighting it, a tree, an entire tree, begins to shake, leaves raining down like it was a F4 tornado. Stop shaking that tree and start shooting the darn Roman candles at the tree shaking, Wyatt shouts. I'm thinking to myself, if your little butt doesn't come up out of these woods. So I grab him. I pick him up, throw him over my shoulder, and run. He was kicking and screaming and acting a fool. We got back to the house, and Dad was in the yard when we came running out. Wyatt was pissed and trying to fight me. Quiet boy, what are you doing in those woods? Dad asks. I'll explain inside, I say panting. We all walk inside, and Dad goes to the closet to get his shotgun. I expected my dad to be confused and write it off, but he says, come in the house, then walks outside into the backyard and fires that shotgun into the air. Mom is now fussing, screaming, what y'all boys done got into now? And dad is just there, standing, looking, and listening. A good two minutes pass, and you hear this roar off in the distance like a train horn. Dad comes inside and says, All of y'all are going to your auntie's house for a few days. Wait, what's going on? I asked. Pack your bags. I'll explain everything later, Dad says. He sends me, my brother, and my mom away and stays. Two days turned into a week before he came and got us. He didn't say what it was or why he did that. He just said it was safe to come home. On to the next one. My son had gone out with some friends and arrived home at around 10.15, which was early for him. I was in the kitchen, cleaning up and preparing the menu for the rest of the week when he came in the house. He looked a little excited and nervous. He sat down across from me at the dining table. He was fidgeting with his fingers and I asked him if he was okay, and he just blurted out that he had seen something. I asked him what, and he said, I think it was a Bigfoot. It was too big and too fast to be a person. He continued and said that as he was nearing our driveway in his car, it came running out of the woods and crossed the road in front of him. He said it looked to be about seven feet tall, dark in color, and seemed to be very large, like tree trunks with hair moving. When he got to where it crossed the road, he stopped the car and looked out the window but didn't see anything. He was a little spooked by the speed of it. The next morning, he was still talking about how fast it was. He said it was running in the direction of my grandparents' old house, which was on the other side of a small patch of woods about an acre away. I went out in the backyard and just listened. Typically, I'd hear birds and the occasional squirrel running on the trees or in the dried leaves, but it was really quiet. I felt this odd sensation, but brushed it off, trying to make a little noise. I made my way to the wood line. I stood and listened. After a few minutes, I heard what I can only describe as a foot stomp, a really loud foot stomp. That was the second time I'd heard the stomp sound, but before, never thought anything of it, because why would I? Now, I wondered if it was this creature my son saw. I peered as best as I could through the trees, but couldn't see anything. I made my way back to the house where my son met me, at the door. He asked if I'd seen anything, and I told him that I'd only heard the foot stomp. He then told me about another sound he heard at 2 a.m. He said he had been lying there, 
and outside his window, he'd heard bird noises. It was odd to hear birds at 2 a.m., as they do sleep, and typically at night, unless they're an owl or even a whippoorwill. He said he knew what they sounded like and was convinced it wasn't that. He said it was really loud, so loud it woke him up. He continued by saying it wasn't just one bird call, that it sounded like one type of bird, then changed as if someone was making various bird sounds from just outside in the backyard. We both chalked it up as a mystery, or quite possibly the Bigfoot he said he saw and went about our day. All was fine. No issues, no sightings, no unusual sounds until a week later. I was woken by what I thought was someone whistling like you do when you call a dog. I was starting to get out of bed when it changed from a whistling to bird noises. I thought about what my son had described, and wouldn't you know it, the bird sounds changed. A bit of fear rose in me, so I decided to stay put. I then heard what I knew were heavy footfalls near my bedroom window, which, like my son's, faces backyard. The bird sounds stopped, but then I heard heavy breathing. Not one to be scared in my own house, I shot up, turned on the light, and raced to the back door. I turned on the light and tossed open the door to see what looked like a large, shadowy figure racing across the yard and into the woods. It crashed through, heading away. I hollered out for it to leave us alone. My son woke and came out. He asked if I'd heard the bird noises. I confirmed that I had and went on to describe all I'd heard and even seen. I told him I wouldn't be scared to live in my own house and I had enough of that with my ex-husband. It's been two months since that night and I haven't heard anything since. My son confirms he hasn't either. On to the next one. In Lewis County in Washington, my friend and I were sitting on his truck tailgate, parked in my parents' driveway, looking at stars and laughing and talking. It was a very clear night with bright moonlight, which is rare for Washington. The truck was about 20 feet from State Highway 7. A crabapple tree had grown on the edge of the property, practically hanging out in the road on Highway 7. The farm my family lived on was surrounded by trees, and we could constantly hear the wind run through them. But we heard a different type of tree movement from the crabapple tree by the highway, and it caught our attention. It sounded like something pushing the branches and fruit snapping off. We got off the truck and walked toward the tree. When we were about 15 feet from the tree, the noise stopped. Then we saw it. A large, pale animal upright on two legs. It paid us little mind as it jogged out from behind the tree and loped across the highway with a swish, swish, swish sound from its feet. It sounded like someone rubbing two pieces of sandpaper together. I was transfixed by the legs. They remained so straight and took such long strides. The left arm swung in huge, deliberate strokes, and other than the feet swishing, we heard no noise. No labored breathing, creaky joints, nothing. The visual portion was as followed. Pale colored, not brown at all. In fact, almost a dirty white color. Long, slender limbs, not fat or bulky. Hair on the legs seemed to be around five or six inches long and swung back and forth with leg motion. Definitely had hands which swung in large, forceful movement. It was hanging on to what I believed to be my parents' crabapple tree. We were unable to move for what seemed like hours, but it must have been only a few seconds. 
It continued down the highway, and when we came to our heads, in nervous excitement, we ran for the truck cab to turn on the headlight. Too late. It was out of sight. We ran inside, grabbed flashlight, and, after trying to explain to my family what had just happened, ended up dragging half of them out into the woods in search of the animal. Needless to say, we heard and found nothing. The next day, though, tracks could be found, although they were not the type you would expect. They were scuffs of tracks from the animal dragging its feet, not the clear, easily identifiable tracks you see on TV. The crabapple tree had a significant section of broken branches and two pieces of apple laying on the ground. My friend was sitting with me on his truck tailgate. In my parents' driveway, we were looking at the stars and being loud, most likely around 10 p.m. The lighting was extraordinarily bright moonlight, starlight, and a barn light. It was on State Highway 7 right in front of my parents' house. Farmland, eight acres surrounded by pine trees. On to the next one. I was working as a National Park Service Ranger naturalist at the Longmire Museum when the following was logged on a National Park Service Natural History Observation Form 10257. Subject of observation was Bigfoot Adult. The description on the form 10257, location on Highway 123, 7 miles from Packwood, Washington, at Forest Service Road 46, next to number 1270. I saw a reddish-brown, bare, human-like animal, six foot tall, stand up in the middle of the road and run away, lumber away, on two legs. I thought it was a Bigfoot. I'm 51. I have a B.A. in biology. I know what I saw was not a deer, a bear, or an elk. It was humanoid. It was also hunting season, though I doubt it was a joke. End of description on form. The ranger spoke with the witness at length about the observation and learned more detail. They thought it was a female animal squatting to urinate. He intended to return to collect a sample. He went to his motel to get a container for the sample, but upon reaching the motel in Packwood, he learned of a medical emergency involving his elderly mother, so he did not return to collect a urine sample. Time of day was 11.30 p.m. Weather was clear. On to the next one. My brother and I, along with our wives, decided to take a weekend drive up to Wanucci Lake in Washington. We were driving in separate vehicles. When we finally reached the dam, we found that the light rain had started turning to snow. We all decided it would be fun to drive to a higher elevation so we could get out of the slush and enjoy a better view. We noticed that a ranger in the area had just opened the seasonal locked gate that takes you up to Weather Wax Peak. Nobody had yet drove up this road for at least six months. The ranger had only unlocked the gate and drove away. His truck tracks in the snow showed this and it was the 1st of October, which is the day the gate is opened as posted. We drove all the way to the top where the snow was approximately 8 inches deep. While we were driving along the top east side of the ridge, my wife suddenly said, Stop the truck. She pointed out some strange tracks that came out of the timber down a steep bank across the road and down into a very steep draw. My brother and I got out to look at the tracks and could not believe our eyes. I could not imagine anybody walking around way up here in this kind of weather. The tracks were very fresh and the falling snow had not yet distorted them. Looking closer, we could easily make out toes and heel prints. They were very large, both in length and width. It was very obvious that these tracks were just made. My brother walked up the bank and had to nearly jump from track to track to make the stride. 
It wasn't until we walked over to the other side of the road and looked down into where this thing went that fear started settling in. My wife began to get upset and wanted to leave right away. We could tell the tracks were very fresh and decided to get back in our trucks and leave. We talked about what we saw all the way back home and for the next couple of weeks. About six or so months later, we were astonished to hear of Bigfoot searchers with helicopters based at the dam. They were even on national TV. We had never told our story to anyone, and this had reinforced our belief that this was Bigfoot. At the time, my brother and I both worked in law enforcement. A friend, who is also a police officer, had told me that there was a team of experts up at the dam with helicopters searching for Bigfoot evidence. This was approximately six months after our encounter with the track. It was snowing fairly heavily at approximately the 3,500-foot level. This was on Weatherwax Ridge, just east of Wanuchi Dam. On to the next one. Hi, I'm Leslie, and I had a traumatic experience with a few members of the Bigfoot species while paddling around in a lake in Vermont. I can't even remember the name of the lake as I went along on a trip with my best friend's family. The following report took place 16 years ago. I was 17 and lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the time. My friend Jasmine and I were only a couple of weeks away from beginning our senior year in high school, and her family offered to take us on a final end of the summer trip before it started to get a lot colder outside. A crazy part about all this was how Jasmine's 13-year-old brother, Duncan, started talking about Bigfoot while we were in the car on our way to the vacation house. That was when their mom mentioned how there were rumors about Bigfoot having been spotted in the area. However, the tone of her voice made it quite clear that she thought it was a bunch of manure. I'm almost certain that it was the first night we were there that we put the TV on mute so we could listen to these odd noises that echoed across the lake. I remember them sounding like they were coming from the opposite shore, which had to be at least a couple of miles away. None of us knew what to label them as at the time, but I'd later come to learn that the appropriate term is whoops. It did sound like a bunch of monkeys were hollering from the other side of the lake. Even though the noise stumped Jasmine's parents, they ultimately concluded that there was a reasonable explanation to them. Bigfoot was anything but a reality. Because of her parents' disregard for the topic, I was able to move on without giving it too much thought. A couple of days later, Jasmine, Duncan, and I decided to take an inflatable boat out onto the lake. Duncan wasn't able to swim, but for whatever reason, he decided not to wear a life vest. He loved to splash around in knee-high water, but never went past that. Even if he was wearing something that would keep him floating at the surface, it was close to the evening hours because I remember the mosquitoes were really bad, which only agitated the situation that was about to unfold. We had been out on the water for maybe 30 minutes. When we began to paddle back toward land, I'll never forget how the trees just beyond the rocky shore were shaking. It started as a very soft vibration, but soon transitioned into violent shaking. Then we began to hear these very animalistic grunts coming from multiple spots behind the edge of the forest. I was initially inclined to believe that it was Jasmine's parents just trying to have some fun by scaring us, but there were only two of them, but definitely more than two individuals making the grunting noises. By this point, we had stopped paddling toward the lakeshore as we were all a bit mystified as to what was going on. Those grunts turned to the sound of children laughing. Only there was something very off about the noise 
that I can't even think of how to describe. I suppose it sounded more like someone trying to mimic the noise of children. While the three of us tried to spot anything within the darkness of the trees, Duncan suddenly cried out, Ow! His hands were covering his right cheek while he winced. What is it? Jasmine said, concerned for her brother. She forcefully moved his hand away from his cheek and found little drops of blood running down his face. Something had been lodged into his skin. It sounded like it was drizzling, but the clear sky above indicated otherwise. I felt a sting on my upper arm. It was so goddamn painful. It was like someone had shot me. A small stone, a bit larger than a pebble, had found its way past the surface of my skin. Get away from us, Jasmine yelled out, still suspecting that it was children who were throwing rocks at us. I had a bad feeling, like there was something else out there, even though I wasn't exactly thinking about Bigfoot. If anything, I think I was suspecting something paranormal, like demons or ghosts, or something along those lines. The small stones didn't stop flying towards us, so we all took cover by curling up on the floor of the boat. The three of us hysterically screamed for help, and I felt the sting of another rock graze my back. It wasn't long after that the boat started to sink. It had been punctured in multiple areas and was quickly losing air. The notion that Duncan couldn't swim made the whole situation even more alarming. I can't say when exactly, but the lack of little splashes in the water around us indicated that the rock throwing had stopped. When I lifted my head just enough so I could see past the edge of the boat, I was blown away by what I saw. Even though I'm almost certain there were more of them, two bodybuilder-looking creatures stood on the shore. Their faces had features that reminded me of what you'd see on older people. If you were to put faces like that on a gorilla's body, that's pretty much what I saw. Keep in mind, I only got a glimpse because it felt risky to stare at them. After I returned my head to the floor of the deflating boat, it wasn't long before I heard the voice of Jasmine and Duncan's father calling out to us. What's going on? With a somewhat casual tone. I think he was assuming that we must have been horsing around and that there probably wasn't much to worry about. But I guess he soon saw that the boat was deflating, and since he knew Duncan couldn't swim, he took off his shoes and ran into the water. As he pulled the boat to shore, I was so worried he would be pelted in the face with rocks, but the creatures seemed to have left the area. When we got to shore, their dad saw Duncan's wound on his cheek and started interrogating Jasmine as to what had happened. When I said that these animals were throwing rocks from the shore, he looked at me like I was a lunatic. It turned out that neither Jasmine nor Duncan had lifted their head to see what was out there. Understandably, they were too afraid of getting hit in the face with another stone. Once we made our way inside, I explained everything that I had seen. Unsurprisingly, the parents still wouldn't believe me. They were convinced that it had to be some local children that had gotten carried away. So, even with the noises that we had heard earlier in the week, Duncan's injury, and my statement, they still refused to believe that Bigfoot, or Big Feet, were around in the area. I think that's a perfect example of all the stubborn, know-it-all attitudes that exist out there. That incident taught me that most humans, if not all, know so very little about the things that are in our world. Ever since that terrifying experience, I've opened my mind to the possibility of almost anything, even UFO abduction. It makes you wonder if there are real organizations out there like the Men in Black. If so, can you imagine what a career like that would entail? I'll never forget the day I learned that Bigfoot is a real creature. On to the next one. They say you don't have many memories from when you were really young as your brain just isn't well enough developed. But I beg to differ. 
I had something happen to me when I was little that I'll never forget. And even though I'm now nearly 50, I still can't decide if it's a good or a bad memory. So I guess maybe it's both. When I was seven, my parents took my brother and me to Glacier National Park. It was part of a three-week road trip across Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming from our home in Salt Lake City. My parents had a small, vintage 1961 Sashta canned ham camp trailer, and they pulled it with their almost new Buick. What a sight. That nice, beautiful sedan pulling an old beat-up trailer. My dad had finished refurbishing the trailer on the inside, but hadn't yet completed the outside. I remember that we got turned away from a couple of nice campgrounds because we looked like gypsies, much to my mom's chagrin. Of course, she laughs about it now. So we went from Salt Lake up through the southern part of Idaho into Montana, straight up to Butte, then on over to Missoula and up to Kalispell. After visiting Glacier, we went on to Yellowstone and the Teton. But that's another story. Part of the reason for going to Glacier was to visit my grandfather and his new wife in the little town of Columbia Falls, which is the gateway to the park. My grandfather had moved there years before, working in a nearby lumber mill before he retired. My grandmother had passed away a good ten years ago, and he'd finally remarried in the spring before we went up there. My parents were anxious to see him and meet his new wife. If I recall correctly, her name was Lillian, but everyone called her Lily. She was a bit younger than him and very pretty and we could tell he felt like he'd made quite the catch from the way he talked about her. Now, my grandpa wasn't what you'd call wealthy, but he was what you'd call well-set, which means he'd done well with what he'd had, with a good retirement and a nice paid-for property. He'd bought ten acres just out of town and turned it into a park-like setting with paths and grass and big trees and a huge flower garden. And, best of all, he'd built his own house, a beautiful theater place that really impressed me, as you didn't see many theater houses in Utah. So, even though I was only seven, I clearly recall that house and its ground, and I also remember the big barbecue he and Lily had for us when we showed up. It was the first time I'd ever had deviled eggs. Mom and Dad slept in the guest room, and my nine-year-old brother, Grady, and I got our little Shasta trailer all to ourselves, parked up there by the house under a big tree. We were pretty happy about that after being camped up in it with my parents on the trip up there. I think my parents were happy about it, too, especially since traveling with Grady was like listening to fingernails on a chalkboard, hour after hour. He's the most hyperactive person I've ever known. If then had been now, he'd probably be on meds for being ADD. At least, he managed to channel it into an appropriate profession when he grew up, owning a busy restaurant, but that's also a different story. We were going to stay there a week, so the first day was spent with the grown-ups sitting around talking while Grady and I played in the big yard, climbing trees, and doing whatever kids that age do. The next evening, we all went out to dinner at some exclusive restaurant in Kalispell, which was Lily's idea. I got the feeling nobody else was very interested, as my mom and dad were still tired from the trip, but Lily insisted. She and Grandpa got all dressed up, making my mom feel self-conscious as she hadn't brought anything that night. I think the only reason they let us in was because they knew my grandpa. I remember my mom talking that night to my dad out by the trailer as they checked on us, making sure we were in bed, saying she felt that Lily was a bit of an extreme personality. She then made us all swear to never repeat that, and 
it became a sort of inside joke for Grady and me. We would use the word extreme every chance we got around my mom, which irritated her to no end. My mom was really good-natured, and we loved teasing her. Anyway, I'm telling you all these details for two reasons. One, to show a little kid can remember things quite well, which will be important later on, and two, to show you what kind of person Lily was. Okay, so there we were, in this beautiful setting near Glacier, where we were getting rested up and visited up. Now, Grandpa was my dad's dad, not my mom's, and my dad wanted to spend some quality time alone with him. But every time they'd be out in the yard talking or something, here would come Lily. She acted like she was afraid to leave my grandpa alone with anyone. So finally, my dad hatched a plan. He would take Grady and my grandpa fishing on the nearby Flathead River. He didn't figure Lily would want to go, especially since she seemed to be taking a dislike to Grady, who probably deserved it, to be fair, as he was good at driving everyone nuts. My dad's plan worked, and they all headed out for the day, leaving me, my mom, and Lily, who had decided to take us into the national park on a little tour. We were all planning on going to Glacier the following day anyway for a picnic, but Lily decided she'd give us a sneak preview, which was fine with my mom and me, though my mom made sure it would only be for a few hours, as she had no intention of getting stuck with her for very long. At this point, I could tell my mom was starting to feel about Lily like Lily felt about Grady. We packed a lunch, grabbed our jackets, and all jumped into Lily's car. Things went well all the way to West Glacier, the side of the park headquarter, where we stopped and got a day pass. Then we went to the shores of Lake McDonald, which was stunningly beautiful. By then, Mom had figured out that Lily's extreme personality also included her driving skills, and she decided she didn't want to go any further, especially not up the narrow Going to the Sun Road, which she'd seen enough pictures of to know it wasn't a walk in the park. No way was she going to put our lives in Lily's hands, and she was adamant about it. Though, she tried to be nice by saying she loved the lake and wanted to spend the day there. Lily wasn't happy, but my mom outstubborned her. After walking along the shore for an hour or so, we had our picnic, and sat for a while, me getting bored and mom getting more frustrated. She wanted to go back to Grandpa's house, and I could tell she had had enough of Lily, who did nothing but tell everyone how great she was and how she really made Grandpa's life better, making him get out, walk and all, and eat right and dress better. She made it sound like he was this sedentary sloth before she met him, but we knew better. Someone maintained all those grounds around his house, and we knew it wasn't her. I think Lily liked having a captive audience, and she kept saying it was too early to go home. So finally, my mom, desperate to get away from her incessant talk, suggested we go hike the short trail she'd seen in the park brochure, something called the Trail of Cedars. It was just up the highway, a few miles, quick to get to, and an easy hike on a raised boardwalk through some big cedars. Lily had no choice, since she'd said she was going to show us Glacier, and we were soon at the parking lot. According to a placard there, the trail was less than a mile long, and the old-growth trees were red cedar and western hemlock, and the Lake McDonald Valley was the eastern edge of the maritime climate of the Pacific Northwest, the humidity allowing the red cedars to grow to height of a hundred feet. It was a land of giants that had escaped fire and avalanche for hundreds of years, a wonderland. Well, a wonderland it truly was. Wide boardwalks meandering through the most amazing trees I'd ever seen, some with trunks wider than I was tall, their trunks covered with the greenest mosses and cradled in giant ferns. The placard said that some of the trees were more than 500 years old, and 
What was even neater was what they called Avalanche Gorge that cut right through the middle of the walk. Its deep, polished walls were filled with the rushing white water of Avalanche Creek, which came from Avalanche Lake only a short hike on up a ways. I can't remember if there was another placard there, but about midway around the trail of the theaters was a junction with the trail to the lake, which was about two miles one way. The area was carved by a massive glacier tens of thousands of years ago, leaving a large bowl with huge mountains nearly all the way around the shallow lake in the center. My mom really wanted to hike the lake, but Lily said she wasn't prepared for such a long walk, as it would end up being around five miles in total. We asked some people walking by, and they said it was an easy, flat hike. My mom decided we were going, regardless, and asked Lily if she would mind waiting in the car. We could easily hike that in an hour, or maybe two at most. Lily was irritated, but she finally gave in and agreed to go with us, but not for long as she needed to get back to the house, which was ironic, seeing how it was where my mom had wanted to go not all that long before. So, off we went. Now, this is a really popular trail, partly because it's so close to Lake McDonald and so accessible, but also because it's easy. It follows along Avalanche Creek, which at this point is just a wide, fast-moving creek though so it soon entered the deep gorge along the trail of the theaters. Even though there were lots of people, it was a really nice hike, and the lake was beautiful, with towering peaks around it and several tall, narrow waterfalls tumbling from a high ridge, one called Monument Falls, and the little Matterhorn high above the basin was quite impressive. I remember it all clearly, as it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. There was nothing like that around Salt Lake. Though the Wasatch are impressive in their own right, I even think Lily was enjoying herself. But when someone said they'd seen a black bear nearby, she decided she wanted to go back. Mom and I wanted to stay longer, but we started back, Lily in the lead. Now, what happened next, I don't remember, which is ironic. As you would think of everything, this would be something I'd never forget. But one minute, I was standing at the edge of the creek, and the next, I was in it. My mom said she didn't see what happened, but Lily said she saw me step on a rock that was loose, and that flipped me into the water. The next thing I knew, I was being buffeted against rocks, tossed along the water like a rag doll stunned. The water carried me along, faster than anyone could run, and my mom and Lily soon lost sight of me, even though they were trying to follow along the bank, yelling and screaming, which alerted others, including a ranger. I've since learned that more people die in glacier in water accidents than from any other reason. The snow and glacial meltwater is cold, and the lakes never warm up above 45 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, creating the potential for quick hypothermia. As I careened down the swift waters of Avalanche Creek, I recall worrying that I would soon be in the gorge where the steep, slick walls would make rescue impossible. I was soon struggling to breathe, and I'd been slammed against enough rocks that I knew it was only a matter of minutes before I would pass out. I remember thinking of Grady and wondering how his life would be without his little sister. My last thought was of my mom. I don't know how long I was out, but I remember waking to a strange sensation of being held against something warm and hairy that smelled like a wet dog. At that point, I didn't even know who or where I was, but I knew someone was carrying me. I immediately started coughing up water and moaning, and whoever was holding me now held me upside down until I started choking. Then again, pulled me up against them, trying to warm me up. As I gradually came to my senses, I looked up into the biggest yellow eyes I've ever seen. They were framed by a huge face, all covered with dark red hair. I remember thinking it was a man who badly needed a shave, but then I realized the nose was all wrong, 
kind of big yet flat, and I gradually became aware what was holding me was no human. I was too out of it to care or even want to understand what was going on. I just wanted to sleep, so I drifted off. Now the big man was shaking me, making me stay awake, and this made me resentful. I asked him why I couldn't sleep, but he shook his head, trying now to get me to stand on my own. I looked again into those eyes, which seemed to radiate a sense of compassion and worry, and I gradually began to remember what had happened, and I knew this creature had rescued me from the water, and as I stood, I could now see it better, and I understood then it wasn't human, but was a soaking mass of wet hair and hugeness. Now above the sound of the nearby rushing creek, I could barely hear people yelling, coming my way, and the creature slowly turned to go, first patting me on the head with what seemed like affection. Its hands were huge and leathery, with no hair on the palms. I should have been afraid as the thing towered over me, but instead I felt a huge surge of appreciation. This thing, whatever it was, had saved my life, and as it turned to go, I reached out and grabbed it by the arm. I remember thinking how big and thick its arms were. It turned back to me in surprise, and I squeezed its arm, too weak to do anything more. It smiled and was gone. Now, people were nearby yelling, and I tried to yell back, but ended up coughing and collapsing. Before I knew it, my mom was there, crying along with the ranger and several others, and they picked me up and carried me down the trail. But here's the deal. When they got me back to Lily's car, she didn't want to let me ride in it because I was wet and smelled funny. My mom and I were actually taken to the hospital by the ranger while Lily went home. She later made what felt like a token call to see how I was doing, and though my dad and granddad came to the hospital along with Grady, Lily didn't come. I remember that Grady was white as a sheet. I spent the night in the hospital, then was released the next day, sore and exhausted. No serious harm was done other than some bruised ribs that bothered me for the rest of our trip, but gradually healed. The funniest thing about it all was the way I smelled. You'd think after being in the water for so long, I would smell nice and clean, but everyone was aghast at how I smelled like a wet dog. The hospital people cleaned me up, and my mom finally decided the smell was from all the mosses in the water, though that really didn't make sense, as I hadn't even seen any moss. Once I was back, we managed to make the most of the few days left, driving the going to the Sun Road and doing some sightseeing. But my dad insisted on taking our car, and Lily always came up with an excuse not to go, even though my grandpa would come along. My mom told me later she thought Lily felt guilty about the way she treated me, but I wasn't so sure about that, thinking she was just being Lily. Our last afternoon there, we again had a barbecue in the big yard, and the talk went to what had happened that day when I fell into the water. I had told Grady about what I'd seen, and he'd believed me implicitly, saying I'd been rescued by a Bigfoot. The whole thing kind of scared me in retrospect. So I decided to tell everyone the whole story. Afterward, nobody said a word except Lily, who said I had to have imagined the whole thing. But... My grandpa was silent for a while, then finally said that he'd heard of a number of Bigfoot accounts by ranchers in Flathead Valley, and also some from the Blackfeet Reservation on the other side of the park. But what got me was when he said that he himself once saw a huge, dark figure peering out from behind the big trees on the Trail of Cedars. He laughed, saying he hadn't lingered to get a better look, as he'd been scared. This made me feel better, though Lily just rolled her eyes. After the barbecue was over, it was getting on toward late afternoon, and my grandpa came over to where I was sitting on a stump and asked, Jill, do you feel good enough to go back out to where they found you? I think it would be a good thing before you go, you know, to give you some closure. I wasn't sure what closure was, but I said yes. I would like to go. 
I wanted my grandpa to see the thing that had saved me. Well, my mom and dad and even Grady wanted to go along. Soon, we were on our way to the Trail of Cedars. Lily didn't want to go, of course. I was still sore, so my grandpa and dad took turns carrying me on their shoulders. My mom knew exactly where to go, as she'd been the one who found me. And before long, we were standing next to the creek, though my dad made sure we didn't get close. Not that any of us would have anyway. Now my mom started crying, and my dad held her close. Grady was also holding her hand. My grandpa asked, Jill, do you feel like crying too? If so, it's okay. This is what closure means. You revisit something and get out your feelings so you can move forward. I'm fine, Grandpa, I replied. I just wish the hairy man would come out and let us see him. I don't think anyone believes me except Grady. Oh, I believe you, Grandpa said. He'd asked Grady to carry a small day pack for him, and he now opened it, taking out a bag of apples and some carrots. We'll leave these as a thank you gift, he said. Then he took a rock from his pocket and placed it next to the apples. On it, Grady had painted the word love. As we stood there, I suddenly felt as if something was watching, and I looked into the dark forest of old-growth cedars, but saw nothing. But I somehow knew the creature was there. Grady now said, I'm getting kind of creeped out. Can we go now? My dad laughed, and we all started back down the trail, me up on my grandpa's shoulders. I turned and looked back, and over the roaring of the creek, I thought I heard something. It sounded like people yelling, looking for me. I felt really strange and wanted to cry, but couldn't, and the sound soon receded back into the roaring of Avalanche Creek. We said our goodbyes the next day, and I remember sleeping most of the way to Missoula, propped up on pillows in the back seat because my ribs hurt. I remember my mom and dad discussing Lily on the way back, and my dad saying that my grandpa was no fool and would eventually figure it out. We all loved Yellowstone, but my parents didn't let me out of their sight for one minute, nor Grady for that matter. But there was no need to. I wasn't going anywhere. I was too sore, plus I was still recovering from the scare of my life. Grady told me years later that he'd been so unnerved by my story, he was afraid to go anywhere in the woods alone for some time afterward, even though he knew Bigfoot had saved my life. So, we finally got back home, and life went on much as it had been. Nothing really new, except for the day my, my grandpa called and said he was coming for a visit. I could tell my mom was conflicted, as she wanted him to come, but she didn't want to have to entertain Lily. But when he told her he and Lily had split up, she actually started dancing around. It was pretty funny, and Grady and I both started doing the same kind of little jig, everyone laughing as we sang a little chant with only one word, extreme. After that, for some time, we do that little jig for no reason at all, even over little things like mom making deviled eggs. It always made her laugh. So when Grandpa showed up, we got the story about Lily, though there wasn't much to tell. Apparently, our trip had started the process of him opening his eyes, and he finally got tired of her telling him what to do all the time. They'd only been divorced a month, and she was already dating someone new. Grandpa seemed much happier, and he asked me to tell him my Bigfoot story several times after that, saying it was quite the deal and I knew he believed me, and I knew he believed me, and when he was ready to go back home, he handed me a small plastic bag with something dark in it. What is it? I asked. Jill, he replied. When we went to visit you at the hospital, you gave us your wet clothes to take home. This was stuck to your jacket. I was going to give it to you before you left, but forgot. I thought you might like it as a keepsake. I opened the baggie to see it had a bunch of long thick, coarse hair. Hair that still smelled faintly like a wet dog. I smiled, thanked him, thinking I had the best grandfather in the world. On to the next one. I grew up in Deer Lodge, Montana, where my parents have a cattle ranch. After I graduated from high school, 
I went to Montana Tech in Butte, just down the road, about 30 minutes. I always wanted to be a geologist, and that's where one goes to study for that in Montana. I'm now working for an oil exploration company in Colorado. Anyway, I met a gal who would become my wife in Butte. She was also studying there. She became a geological engineer, but is now staying home with the kids for a few years. At the time of this story, I had no idea she was to become my wife, or this event never would have happened. I would have just gone home and waited for her to call me. It was summer, and I was working on the ranch. I helped out in the summers as my parents needed me. I was almost done with school. I would go back to school in the fall, start my fourth and last year there. I always went to go see my girl and future wife Kay in Butte on weekends. I'd go see her Saturday mornings and go back home Sunday night. Well, this particular visit didn't go too well. We went out to that casino in the old part of town for a late breakfast. Those casinos have the best and cheapest food around, so we always went there. That's when Kay told me she wanted to start dating other guys. She wanted to be sure I was the right guy for her. She felt we were both too young to be hooked on each other. We needed to shop around more, so to speak. I was really shook up, but I agreed it was an okay idea and left. I didn't want to date anyone else. I knew she was the one. I'd been out with enough women to know that. So I just told her to go ahead and date and call me when she was ready to go out with me again, if ever, assuming I hadn't found some other girl by then, that is, I was pretty mad. So I just got in my old pickup and headed home, back to Deer Lodge. I realized later I had forgotten to give her a ride back to her apartment, but by then it was too late. I was on down the road, and I figured I'd never see her again anyway. I got partway back when I felt the need to be alone. I didn't want to go home and explain everything to my parents as to why I was back early. I always carry emergency gear in my truck. I had my sleeping bag and some water and some chips and beer and a few candy bars. So I just decided to head out and spend the night out in the mountains camping. It would be good for me, like the old days before I met Kay when I camped a lot. I don't want to give the exact location of where I got off the freeway, but let's just say it's a nowhere exit. There's no town there, just a road going up into the mountain. A lot of western Montana is like that, freeway exit that give access to hunting and ranch roads. This particular road crossed to the Clark Fork River and went through a lot of beautiful cottonwoods down in valley and there's a big cattle ranch there. It's a really nice place, and the owner was a family friend, a long-time rancher there. I thought about stopping, but I was in no frame of mind to talk to anyone. So I just kept going on up the road, which soon left the wide valley and started up the mountain into the Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest. I didn't want to get up there too high, because then I'd be in the deep timber, and I've always liked being able to see out a bit. And most of western Montana is grizzly country, and I sure as heck didn't want to meet one of those guys. So I went up a few miles and pulled over at the edge of the woods into a clearing. There were cattle lounging around in the shade, and I noticed the ranch had put out salt licks for them there. A small creek ran nearby, a perfect spot, except for the dam cattle and their manure and incessant flies. The cattle cleared out when they saw me coming, so I decided to just go ahead and camp there. Camping was no big deal for me. I would just throw my sleeping bag on a pad in the back of my truck as it had a small camper shell on it. I was protected from the element and pretty much any bears or such and I could crawl into the front through the window in the back of the cab if I needed to. But it was way too early to think about going to bed. It wasn't even noon yet. I had most of the day all to myself.
to mourn and feel bad, which I needed, cause I sure as heck did feel bad. I was broken hearted. So I sat there a while in the shade until the flies finally got to me, and then I decided to go for a hike. I would climb up into a small cliff I could see that looked to be about a half mile away and do some geologizing. That always made me feel better looking at rocks. So I put my water into my day pack with the candy bars and headed out. I was already feeling better. I was soon up on the cliff and exploring around, spending the better part of the day there figuring out the geology and walking the contacts. I still had a dull ache where my heart was supposed to be, but I was kind of wondering what it would be like to date other women. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad after all. I started wondering if that cute girl in my historical geology class last semester would be open to the idea, and that perked me up a bit. I knew her name, and it wouldn't be hard to find her when the fall semester started. I noticed it was getting on towards sunset, so I decided to head back, my pack now full of rocks, the candy bars, and most of the water gone. I was starting to get hungry, and I wondered if I could make it to morning. If not, I could always just head home. All of a sudden, it hit me what Kay had said and done. I think I'd been in a bit of denial until then, maybe a survival mechanism. But it just hit me hard when I saw the sun about to set, because usually we'd go sit on her deck together Saturday evenings and watch the sunset while eating homemade pizza. And now, here I was, out in the wilderness, hungry and alone. Boom. Just like that. Things had changed so fast I couldn't even process it. I was suddenly really angry at her and the world in general. I picked up a big stick and started smashing it against a big tree, yelling and cussing, just as mad as you can get, letting off steam. Then I sat down and started crying, which ended up being a wailing sound before I finally got a grip on myself. What if one of the cowboys from the ranch was nearby and heard me? I'd be really embarrassed. So I tucked it in and got up and started back toward my truck. It was really getting dark now. And even though I got my flashlight from my pack, I wasn't really sure exactly where the truck was. I began to feel really uncomfortable. I forgot all about Kay except to wonder if she would care when they found my body, either mangled by a grizzly or from the fall off some unseen outcropping in the dark. I was a fool to have let the dark catch me. No wonder she wanted to look around for someone else. I angled in the general direction I thought the truck would be in and was walking along when I first heard the sound. Something was in the bushes nearby, maybe 50 feet to my right. It was walking along just like I was, but staying hidden. I could hear it crunching in the brush, and it sounded like it was on two legs from the way the footsteps went. That would mean it wasn't a grizzly, probably anyway, as they walked on all fours. But what was it? Too big to be a coyote, and too noisy to be a cougar. And anyway, cougars go on all fours. A person? No. Nobody could see in the dark to walk through the bushes at the same pace I was walking, without stumbling and falling. I wondered what all my wailing and noise had attracted. I shone my light in the general direction of the sound and called out, but I could see nothing. When I stopped, it stopped, and when I started, it started. It totally weirded me out. I wanted to run, but I couldn't see well enough. The best I could do was to get back to my truck and get the heck out of there. But it was so dark now that I had no idea where the truck even was. I wanted to stop and sit down and cry and let whatever it was have me. I was starting to just not give a damn anymore. It had been a hard day. But I kept walking and I just kept angling toward where I thought the truck was until I finally hit the road. I was relieved. Maybe the thing would go away now. Then it dawned on me 
that I had no idea if the truck was above me or below me. I had possibly come out onto the road below where it was parked. I had no way of knowing, but I did know I had to keep walking downhill. There was no way I was going back up into the forest. If I did and the truck was below me, I would never find it and would end up in even dire straits. So I just kept walking downhill, shining my light back and forth, hoping to see the reflection of metal and the footsteps continued alongside me in the brush. I can't begin to tell you how scared I was. I've never prayed so hard in my life. I had the most dire feeling, a feeling of true dread that something bad was going to happen, and I couldn't shake it. I was nearly panicked, and I was kicking myself that I hadn't brought my deer rifle from the truck. I still had my pack full of rocks, and I grabbed a couple of those. The road just kept going until all of a sudden there was something standing dead on in the center of it. Something big. I yelled out, scared, cussing at it, until I realized it was a steer. It stood there for a moment, blinded by my light, then turned and ran right toward whatever was stalking me. I heard a loud and very deep growl, and all of a sudden the steer turned back and nearly ran over me, terrified Whatever was there was more frightening to the steer than I was, and that scared me more, if possible. I will never forget the sound of that growl. It gave me chills. At that point, I ran. I could now see the light of the cattle ranch down the road ahead, maybe a half a mile or so, and all I knew to do was run like heck towards them. And then I saw it. The creature. It outran me and came upon the road and doubled back, as if to catch me. It was huge, a dull white, like it had white hair or fur. Its eyes looked to be a couple of feet above my head, and I'm six feet tall. And those eyes, they glowed red, just like a light on a Christmas tree. It wasn't a reflection of my light, like you see with some animals. As it came toward me, all I knew to do was throw the rocks I had, and I hit it. I bellowed like a bull when I threw the rock, as a shot of adrenaline surged through me. By then, the creature was nearly to me, but when the rocks hit it, it stopped. It stood there, looking at me for a moment, and I swear the expression on its face was one of shock. I'm not making this up, and what I learned later confirmed that possibility. It then slipped off the road back into the bushes and disappeared. I turned and ran. No way was I going to give it a second chance. I was soon at the ranch, pounding on the front door, gasping for air. The door quickly opened, and I recognized Sid, the rancher. Sid had eaten many meals at my parents' house, and he was a good friend of the family. He looked really surprised to see me. I went inside and slammed the door, panicked. Well, Sid's a good guy, and he told me to sit down. Everything was all right. I was safe there. I hadn't said a word to him about what I'd seen. He locked the door and then turned all the lights on outside, the big halogen yard light. Sid acted like he knew exactly what was going on. He had three stock dogs, and they all sat there in the kitchen with us, quiet as could be. I finally calmed down enough to tell Sid my truck was up the road and wouldn't start and would he mind giving me a ride back up there to get it. Maybe in the morning, since it was so late, I added, even though it hadn't been dark all that long. Sid must have found this kind of suspicious, but he grinned. Then he said, sure, I could spend the night there in the spare room and we'd go get the truck the next day. He then asked if I'd had any dinner and started fixing me some bacon and pancakes. I swear, bacon and pancakes have never tasted so good before or since. The stock dogs all got some, then Sid made another big batch and took it and threw it out over the fence. He said it was for the pigs, but no respectable cattle ranch has pigs. Sid then showed me the spare room and told me I would be fine there. Nothing would bother me, and to sleep in as late as I wanted. 
you'd have more bacon and pancake ready for breakfast. Then we'd go get that truck. He told me I should get some sleep because I was as white as a ghost. And he was a bit worried about me. I lay there in the bed trying to rehash what had definitely been the strangest and most stressful day of my life. I felt like someone in a weird film where nothing makes sense. In fact, I wasn't even sure I hadn't gone nuts and wasn't in the loony bin. I had no bearings, no reason to believe anything was normal in any way, so I just went to sleep. I later had nightmares about the whole thing, but that night I slept like a baby. I felt very secure there with Sid and his stock dog. Sid was one of the most competent and trustworthy ranchers in the area. The next day, after breakfast and coffee, we went out to get my truck, and I saw huge footprints in the dirt roadway, like someone walking barefoot, someone really huge. I looked at Sid to see if he noticed, and he just smiled. When we got to my truck, he waited while I started it and said he was going to follow me back down to make sure it ran okay. He never even asked what was wrong with it. It had started up just fine. So Sid followed me back down to the ranch, and when we got there, he pulled up next to me and got out. He leaned up against my truck and told me that it would probably be for the best if I didn't talk too much about what I'd seen last night. I was surprised and said so, asking him if he knew what I'd seen. He replied that sure, all the guys on the ranch knew about old Snowball. That's what they called him. Snowball had been around for years and had never harmed anyone, though nobody trusted him much. It was standard operating procedure to not go anywhere unarmed. When I told Sid how the creature had started coming for me, Sid said that Snowball probably hadn't meant me any harm. He was probably concerned for me. I felt incredulous, but Sid said Snowball had never actually harmed anyone other than scaring them half to death. I figured Sid was just trying to make me feel less afraid. He told me the creature had been there for at least 10 years, and everyone on the ranch knew about him. But it was an unspoken rule to not mention him to anyone else. They would even leave him a deer each year during the fall hunt to kind of tide him through the winter, though Snowball never stuck around. Where he went, they didn't know. Maybe he hibernated, but he always came back each spring. I was soon on my way, feeling like I had just hallucinated the whole thing. I went on home and spent the next week just doing my chores around the ranch and then sitting in my room each evening, staring at the wall. I told my parents I was sick. I had decided reality wasn't what I thought it was, both as far as Kay went and as far as the natural world went. I wasn't prepared for the thought that Kay would give me the boot, nor that there were friendly Sasquatch near Deer Lodge, Montana, or any kind of Sasquatch for that matter. I felt like I was lost at sea and had no idea where to turn. Finally, about a week after the incident, Sid showed up at our ranch and asked if I wanted to go into town and have lunch. I really didn't, but I said yes anyway just to humor the old guy. It turned out to be a good thing because we sat and talked about Snowball for a long time. Sid told me lots of stories about the Sasquatch and invited me to come back out to his ranch, which I did. I didn't see Snowball, but I did talk to some of his hands about it, and this finally helped me get a grip with the whole thing. About two weeks later, Kay called me. She'd been busy dating other guys, and she was ready to concede that I was the real deal, and she missed me. I was kind of put off at first. She'd hurt my feelings, but the sound of her voice melted everything away. I was at her apartment that very evening, where she told me how sorry she was and how much she cared. We got engaged and were married the day after we both graduated from college. I never told her about Snowball, honoring Sid's request, plus I knew she'd think I was crazy. I went back out to his ranch a year later, and Snowball hadn't showed up after a particularly hard winter. They figured he had gone to the great Sasquatch hunting ground in the sky and said they kind of missed the old fellow, even though 
he never hung around the ranch much, just to be fed occasionally when Sid threw food over the fence. Kay and I both got jobs in Brazil, of all places, doing mineral exploration. We were away from Montana for several years, but when we finally returned, I saw Sid one day in Deer Lodge. He informed me that Snowball had come back, and had been looking pretty gaunt, but they soon had him fattened up with bacon and pancakes. They said I should come out sometime and visit. He'd make me a batch. But it's a bit of a drive from Colorado, where we now live. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!